hinnata see äh, inglise keeles, sest ma tean, et meil on inglise keeselt rahvas siin vahe. So hello from Ladyfest. So happy that you're here. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank the, um, the Finnish Institute because they are the ones that, because of them, we have this talk. Um, they're filming right now. This is going to be in the internet later, so don't worry, you're not going to be filming from you're going to be filming from behind, so that you know. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be doing a lot of talking. Just reminded that. Uh, we have a whole end uh, campaign right now where we are still asking for money. So if you like this this uh, event and we like all our events, then please support us. We really, really appreciate it because without it, we cannot do this amazing thing. So without further ado, Luca. Hi, there's room in the front. <laughs> Come in the front if you don't have space and there's still seats on the side. And maybe... Uh, Maybe you can move the stairs also if you want to sit on the stairs on the side there and there's a The best part on the couch. Yeah. Um, I'm happy there's so many people here. Um, welcome to the talk. And um, thank you, Ladyfest, for organizing this. Um, about myself, I guess I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ruka Toivonen. Uh, I'm based in Helsinki. I'm an activist. Um, what should I... Uh, about my activism, I guess uh, I started doing environmental activism and, and feminist projects and squatting houses and, and, and like trespassing in military areas and things like this. About the same time when I started studying social and economic history in the University of Helsinki. Uh, so it's always like this uh, thin line when I was, uh, when, it, when it comes to like politics and history, it was always a thin line between uh, uh, doing activism and, and studying. And then, yeah, then I had a burnout and I quit uni. So I dropped out and I worked with disabled children. Uh, I'm still an activist though. So, uh, yeah. So this is really not about my academic merits so much. And I also think that my highest education, I've always considered that to be sort of activism. And uh, discussing with different people with different backgrounds. And that's, I think, like, that's, that's really where the sort of the knowledge, like the real knowledge of the world is distributed. Um, so I also hope that if something is unclear, that you raise your hand and you ask. Uh, we want to... Uh, we want to make this uh, accessible in this way, and um, yeah, not that everything is uh, unclear. I mean, nothing is ever clear and clean cut as such, but at least that like my my sort of thoughts will be accessible to you. Question: I think about it. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if I have anything else to say about myself. I will be here at the party after. There's uh, also another wonderful talk about uh, LGBTQ disability in Belarus and then there's a party tonight here so if you want to come talk to me after uh, stay at the party and, and then come and talk yeah um, yeah I guess that's it about the introduction um, let's see if this works it's a bit slow can you maybe it can be that's uh, yeah can also be the math? Yeah, it's just the math. Okay, we're fine. Good. <laughs> okay, uh, glossary, some terminology, because we're dealing with uh, with difficult words here. Uh, a lot of these things, really, they really don't even have names. Uh, also, English is maybe not your first language. Um, so, I'm just going to quickly go through a few words that I'm going to talk about and what I mean when I talk about them, because there's different meanings to these words as well. Mm. So about gender, when I talk about gender, uh, I talk about something that's a social construction. Uh, as much as it is attached to biology in the sense that, uh, that, uh, that like, bi biological understanding of gender is very marked 
by, by symbolism, by ideas, by our expectations of what uh, gender and different genders should look like. And, and your gender affects how you're going to be treated in this world. So also we're going to talk about gender hierarchies. Um, there's more than two genders in the world. I'm a transgender person, for example, myself. Um, but the world treats genders in a very binary way. So when we look at history and when we look at gender hierarchies, there's a lot of these categorizations. So I will be talking a lot about categories, but uh, that doesn't necessarily represent my own understanding of gender, but of like how people are treated in the world, if you get the difference. Yeah. Uh, sexuality, or I prefer to use plural sexualities. I don't actually know how to define that. I don't know why I put it in the glossary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but there's a lot of like, there's a lot of this uh, sort of black and white division, something that I guess would be called taxonomies in the academy. Uh, man, woman, uh, straight, um, gay or lesbian, um, also feminine, masculine, things like that, like these sort of divisions that sort of, uh, define how we understand sexuality. And there are so many other ways to define it as well, but they're not so common. You could also think of sexuality as, even, even with this kinky vanilla, like in terms of dividing sexual practices, they, people divide it into something that's like the ordinary stuff and then the not ordinary stuff, which is also like, really <laughs> that's also like a division. So uh, that's like a really Western way of, of categorizing and like compartmentalizing the world around us. But, uh, but that also has to do with the hierarchies and we will come back to that later. <laughs> Uh, heteronormativity, is that like a word that sort of needs explanation? I think it's, uh, it's basically the, the assumption that, uh, it's like the assumption that people are straight, the assumption that the world is run uh, and managed by and for straight people and for straight families, and, and this normativity that sort of like affects queer people as well, not just straight people. Mm. It's also a hierarchy in the sense that so everything that is considered straight is considered normal and then the rest is considered marginal. Mm. So it doesn't have to do like with sex itself so much but more like with the symbols and the meanings behind it. Uh, homonormativity, this is a nice one, a fun one. Uh, it's when in the world uh, that is heteronormative uh, a lot of uh, LGBT politics sort of falls into this uh, into this uh, normative ways of understanding identities, and sort of uh, is easily assimilated into this very straight dominated world. So, um, so there are ways that LGBT politics can be homonormative in the sense that it sort of mimics the the symbolism and the the norms and the values of this of this hetero normative system that we live in. Disability. Mm. Disability, I guess, is understood as something that uh, defines health as the opposite of health and defines ability as the opposite of ability. And I guess most people also experience some level of disability during their lives if they live to grow old, for example but this is not considered because the health is such a, such a strong norm in our society that people sort of want to categorize it as something outside of their own persona in a way. Mm. I guess the, the most important thing about disability that I want to say here is that uh, it's, not, uh, it's not people's bodily abilities as such that make them disabled. Like that's a really old fashioned idea. Um, what makes you disabled is society that puts uh, sort of blocks uh, you from doing things that you would like to. Uh, that sort of um, that sort of uh, prioritizes uh, able-bodied people uh, in a way that uh, in a way that makes uh, spaces and venues and, and all that like inaccessible. For example, by putting up a staircase in front of a lecture room, uh, <laughs> like here today. So. Uh, I mean, if, we're, if, we were in a, if we were on street level with accessible toilets, then that person would, person in a wheelchair would not be disabled from coming here. 
So in that sense, like visibility is like a social architecture as much as it is, and, and also like a physical architecture, but it's outside the body as much as it's like internalized. So, and this is, I think, very important uh, when we talk about norms. Mm, cis and trans, cisgender. Uh, cisgender person is a person who is um, comfortable and identifies with the gender that they were assigned to at birth. Trans person, um, the opposite, I guess. Someone who does not identify with their assigned gender at birth. For example, me. Race. There's no uh, sort of, um, there's no quotation marks, but of course we know that like race as such like uh, does not uh, not exist like it's this 1800s idea of different races within the human race. Uh, that of course does not exist, but it doesn't mean that uh, that racist and racialized hierarchies don't exist. So I think it's useful to talk about race in order to understand those hierarchies and in order to understand that oppression. So there's also a word called racialized, which is used in, and also racialisera in Swedish, it's very common to use this word, um, which basically means like people, identities, bodies, nationalities, also I guess relationships or pictures, images could for example be racialized. So something or someone from the outside uh, sort of racializing somebody. So uh, imposing like prejudice or oppression on them because of their color of their skin or, or, or that kind of things, a hijab. Um, eugenics or racial hygiene, we're going to talk about that. Uh, I'm going to explain what it has to do with gender and sexuality. It has a lot to do with it. A lot, a lot. Uh, but it basically means uh, management and modification of, uh, of population and sort of like it's based on this social Darwinist idea of, of, of keeping uh, unwanted qualities uh, sort of marginal or outside of certain populations. So it's like population management in this very violent way. Uh, examples of. And then queer. Um, let's, yeah, let's leave, a, let's leave that open, actually, uh, because I'm not sure how I would define queer in a short way. So let's leave it open. Enough for discussion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then biopolitics. I think it has the word was in the introduction text at least, so I will explain shortly what I mean with that. And uh, yes, but and then but before that, I'm going to talk a little bit about just the word nation state. That's also like a, that was a big word in the in the presentation in the beginning. So I guess my idea was here to just sort of. Um, emphasize that it's changed a lot within the past uh, 200 years, the way we understand citizenship and nationalities. Like, people think it's a very old institution, but it's not. The nation state as such, like, in a way that it has existed. Just make room for the people, please. Um, um, it, has exist, it has existed for a couple of hundred years, not for much longer, really. Um, I think before that, people were sort of more um, more seen as uh, subjects of a king or an emperor, while uh, in the modern states, there's uh, this thing called citizenship. And not, in there, not everyone is entitled to citizenship. Uh, and you, you, you need certain things, you need to be born in a country, there's certain criteria for, for citizenship. Like for me as a Finnish citizen, I was born in Finland and then I got the citizenship. It wasn't, I didn't ask for it, but I got it. Some other people ask for it, they don't get it. Yeah. But basically the nation states, they are not such an old invention at all. Before that it was, it was kind of a different hierarchy, kind of a different system. And, and citizenship is a very sort of, it's very like, very much within. It's very, it's very sort of tied to the government, the government that that uh, it's subject. To. So, uh, so it's a very tight relationship between the people, the citizens, and the governance. Even if the governance is not so much about executing people in the public square there every second someday because they did something naughty, um, it's still a very tight relationship in terms of this healthcare, schooling, all that that kind of makes you a citizen of a nation as well. 
And also there's this illusion of national um, appearance, I guess, that everyone, uh, everyone who is a citizen of a nation also is part of a nationality. And there's all this linguistic and ethnic, like language and ethnic based uh, ideas of, of what a citizen should be like, what kind of qualities they have. So, yeah. Biopolitics, that was, I guess, the most sort of unknown word in this, so I wanted to explain it clearly. Um, biopolitics in this lecture, it can mean other things, but in this, uh, talk it will I will mean managing and governing of human life. Uh, human life especially I'm not gonna talk about other uh, other animals and humans here or, or managing of other kind of life. Mm. But basically different uh, different kind of rulers and different kind of governments have had different ways of um, or different kinds of control of politics in terms of like how sort of disciplined and how direct these uh, mechanisms are. Um, so that's about control of politics really, that it can be, it can take so many different war forms and we're going to go through like a little bit sort of maybe not contradictory forms but different forms and you can see that some of them are very subtle and some of them are very direct. Mm. And, and We'll do that through like some case examples uh, later. Mm. But basically, this biopolitics is like it like constitutes this rule or system of ruling in the nation state. It's very much in the in the core of it. And these questions of reproduction and family. Oh, there's a typo. Uh, can be like you can maybe understand why they're so crucial for biopolitics, like why reproduction is, is so crucial for managing human life. I mean, it makes sense. Um, so that means there's a lot of interest in gender and sexuality, like state is very interested in that. Mm. But they're not the only axis of power. I, I call them axis of power. You could call them like hierarchies or systems of privilege or something like that. I would call them axis of power or there's bio power here in the slides. Uh, but it's not just gender and sexuality, I mean, there's also uh, ability, like we talked about disability earlier. Uh, health, very important, very important. Um, and class, for example, is really, really crucial, although it's not a lot, it's not very often talked about, uh, because we live in this uh, neoliberalist uh, time that sort of favors this really middle class understanding of, of uh, what uh, identities uh, should consist of. So what's what's like legitimate and what's recognizable identity for, for a human being to have. Mm. But yeah, basically the biopolitics, they all, it always operates in these crossroads of these power axes and that's kind of what we're going to look at later. Uh, the pictures don't show very clear, clearly, but that's actually nice because it means it's going to be more of a surprise. Uh, donor trouble. Uh, I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need three volunteers soon. I'm gonna ask uh, three volunteers to read a dialogue with me. It's gonna be fun. So I hope I, I, I get people to stand here. How many of you have remember or have seen the the L word? Uh, <laughs> This this uh, is amazing, amazing. Uh, <laughs> this amazing. Uh, LGBT drama, I, was it like, what, 10, 15 years back? Maybe 2005, they started showing it in Finland at least. Uh, it's about these mainly lesbian and bisexual women living in LA. They're all very rich and uh, they hardly ever work and they all have swimming pools. <laughs> a lot of relationship drama, so it's like, just, it's like a completely unrealistic representation of anything queer. But it's, it's quite entertaining. And I have here um, a short dialogue that I'm going to need three people to read for me. And it's from the L word. It's from the pilot uh, episode of season one. So it's not a spoiler for those who <laughs> It's not a spoiler for them. And it's very sort of simple and easy. So, uh, so uh, don't be shy. Um, there, is, uh, there is Beth. She's a... Um, Beth is a... Um, 
carrier woman, like a very powerful, very dominating carrier woman. Most of the time in the first uh, pilot episode, she's actually being quite an asshole. Um, but, in the, but, it, but in this dialogue, she has something smart to say about, uh, about racial issues. Um, she's sort of the breadwinner of the family. And then there's Tina, um, her um, spouse or girlfriend, who is white, unlike Beth, uh, who is going to be the to-be birth mother. Of a child, they're planning to have a child together. They want to, uh, and they want to sort of, they have want uh, to Tina to give birth to this child. So instead of adopting a child, they want to give birth to a child. And they're looking for a donor, and they're going donor trouble. It's hard to find a donor because the donor has to be artistic and healthy and, <laughs> and smart, and they have all these criteria, which is also like uh, we'll get into that. Soon. But can I please have three volunteers? Anybody? One, two, perfect. Can we have a third one? Yeah, there was. Yeah. Yes, great. Awesome. And you come here. And then we'll do. Um, let's see. Let's see. It's going to be. You get Tina. And the kitchen. Um, you're gonna no Beth is the okay. Beth is the but but she's naughty she's being a bit crazy. Uh, you get to you get to have Beth and you get to have Marcus the potential donor. So um, the first uh, is, is two scenes basically. So there's first there's going to be a dialogue between uh, the to be donor Marcus. Marcus can wait at this point uh, and Tina. Okay, so Beth is away working hard because she's a career woman, and uh, these two are having a conversation. T uh, Beth has uh, sort of booked Marcus, and they're on their way. They're supposed to go to the to the birth clinic to donate some sperm in the bank. Wait, was Tina the one pregnant? Tina is the one to one be pregnant. pregnant. <laughs> she was to be pregnant. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Marcus shows up the door, rings the doorbell. Tina comes and opens. Um, Marcus? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was considering lowering my voice, but. Because the face is a I have to get something. Have a seat and uh, then we'll go. Okay, so Tina is a bit startled and leaves for a minute, then is a little bit upset, and then she returns. <laughs> Tina, did uh, Beth not tell you I was black? <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not at all. But um, she didn't tell me because it it doesn't matter either way, right? Well, I can't answer that for you. <laughs> okay. So that was uh, Tina's confusion meeting the donor for the first time. Uh, he was not expecting a black man, and this is sort of the scene that's the this is written out. Uh, Marcus leaves, thank you for the sperm, they go to the clinic. <laughs> <laughs> That's not showing very clearly, they are actually at the clinic. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. And then, after that, Tina is a bit upset and, and startled. Um, uh, so, Beth and Tina are having an argument. I didn't say I didn't want a black donor. <laughs> I just think we should have, should have discussed it, though. We absolutely discussed it, Tina, right in the very beginning. We said that if, we were, uh, if you were going to the, be the birth mother, then we should consider finding an African-American donor. That way, the child would be more like our child. Look at me, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel qualified to be a mother of a child who is half, Ameri uh, half African-American. I don't know what it means to be black. I think I can make a contribution in that department. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you so much uh, for the helpers. Um, yeah. I think it's an interesting scene in uh, in so many ways. I mean, first of all, Tina doesn't feel qualified to be the birth mother of a child who is half. African American. So, like, what does that sort of? How does that read to to Beth, like, who is an asshole in the in the, in the episode, but but who has a very like very good point here that uh, that Tina is being a bit of a racist. Um, 
but also just like just going further into this whole dynamics like like whether it, whether the people what they decide I mean in the end uh, they look for donors and, and and in the end actually Tina ends up uh, using the sperm and they have this beautiful uh, baby called Angelica and all that everything goes nicely I guess but um, but in terms of this adoption business I mean these two people who are adopting a child and who are not going to conceive it together because they're uh, because they don't have a sperm and a womb, I suppose, to, to, to make that happen. They still want to simulate this uh, sort of heteronormative family where, where they would, uh, in order to, uh, to look like a family and look like a parent and another parent of the child, they want the child to be biracial. There's like, I kind of understand the need for that, but I think it's also interesting in terms of like, why is it important to simulate this kind of family where the baby is being conceived uh, inside the, the, the family that consists of only two people? Like, why is this important? And like, which kind of symbolics and which kind of sort of symbolic system does it serve? This is like a very good question. Um, let alone that they want the donor to be uh, artistic because Beth and Beth is this. Uh, uh, artsy curator power woman so they want the, the the donor to be they want to be they want him to be healthy and they want him to be artistic and all these things so sort of I guess they're looking for like genetic qualifications in the parent at the same time while while I don't know if artist artistic qualities are a genetic quality in a person like that's a sort of good question can you sort of get that but it's still very important for them so it raises a lot of questions about like why why are they even thinking about this? Um, international adoption is another interesting topic. Um, it has to do with uh, uh, it has to do with uh, firstly the selection of children for adoption. They mostly come from the global south, I guess. Uh, in terms of inter in international adoption, I have not heard of. Uh, Cases where uh, where uh, wealthy families from Germany be adopting their children to uh, to Nigeria because it's uh, the weather is sunnier and the fruit grows around the year and it's like there's more music and and like just like a it's a nicer place to be in so that doesn't really happen as far as I know mm. so there is this hierarchy there's like this geopolitics behind it. And then the selection of children for adoption, uh, also selection of parents, that's really like, uh, it's really hierarchical and it's very difficult, at least in Finland, it's a, it's, there are big institutions and you need to have a lot of money to be qualified as an adopted parent. You need to have a steady job. <laughs> mm. You could be a lesbian couple or, or, uh, or a gay couple, I suppose, but it would be very, very, very difficult. So there's also this uh, ideal of like a straight bourgeois family adopting a child uh, from the third world. So, so saving this uh, black or brown baby to this white family that's rich and wealthy. And then that baby's gonna have a nice life. I know several people who have been very traumatized by this, by uh, living in a family where their parents had no clue, no idea whatsoever of what it is like to uh, to face racism in the streets every day because as white people they did not have that experience and yet they still felt qualified to adopt this baby who was going to face a lot of racism growing up in the global north so you get the point so there's all these axes of power like we see like there's poverty versus wealth and then there's the colonized versus the colonial or colonizing and yeah global south versus global north mm. So you can sort of see the biopolitics uh, as a part of larger like geopolitics. This is just an image that I sort of found online after a long time. I've been, I remember looking at it some 10 years ago. It's a black woman uh, or a black person breastfeeding a, a white baby. It was taken down from the campaign. It was the United Colors of Benetton advertisement and it was in the catalog. And it was so provocative that people took it down. They didn't like it. so. Uh, in order for them to spread the catalog in the 
in the EU, I think they had to give up a lot of the images. Um, and this is one of the, like, I think, the best sort of known image. Custody. Mm. Custody, I don't know. Uh, there's a question mark. Do you, I don't know if you think that custody is sort of adoption reversed. I mean, people are taken away from their parents because they're not qualified to be good parents. Someone, someone else goes and takes care of them. Sometimes they go and they are adopted, but sometimes they grow up in institutions instead. Mm. And of course there is good parenting and there's bad parenting. And that's a bad thing. And then there's extremely bad parenting when people should be taken to custody, really, like children should be. But sort of how do you assess this from the outside? Well, this I guess my question. How do you how do you sort of how do you measure it? Mm. And I think there also you can see, for example, in the in any and, and the more sort of the deeper you go into social politics and social welfare, um, the more difficult it gets. Because uh, what we think of as good parenting has like all these connections to a middle class family life that is again heteronormative, that is again based on people having steady jobs and a lot of wealth. And if you don't fit in those categories, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble when you actually need uh, social support. Mm -hmm. I put case Jasmine here uh, because her case is like a really sort of tragic but also interesting uh, intersection of class and uh, sexuality and gender. Uh, it happened in Sweden in 2013. Uh, Jasmine, or Birgit Jasmine, was her, I guess, artistic name. Uh, she, was, uh, she was a sex worker and a board member of this Swedish uh, sex workers union called Rose Alliance. And uh, yeah, so she was a sex workers rights activist until 2013 when she was murdered by her ex, um, ex-boyfriend. Mm -hmm. They had children together and uh, Jasmine, she had several, uh, several years ago, she had lost custody of the children because the social welfare found out that she was a sex worker and they didn't think that she was qualified to take care of her children anymore because they said that she was doing uh, self-harm by selling uh, sexual services. So. Um, and, and uh, Jasmine, she had warned the social offices, the social worker, that um, the ex-boyfriend had been abusive in the relationship and had been violent. And uh, and even in even this even in this case, the social services they carried out this emergency uh, custody operation, uh, and they removed the, the the children from her home and they placed them in the care of the father. So uh, she basically fought for the right to see the children throughout these several court cases in the court. And this is the quotation. Even if I can't get my kids back, I will make sure this never happens to any other sex worker. Mm -hmm. um, so she defended uh, her livelihood, basically, as a sex worker, against the court's arguments um, of her doing self-harm. And. Uh, Despite the warnings that the, the ex-boyfriend was, uh, was uh, threatening her, even at the time, and stalking her after the relationship, um, the court decided that he was still a better parent. Mm. And, they stole, and they chose him as the, as the suitable parent for the children. And then she was arranged to see the, uh, her son in uh, July in 2013. Um, her ex-partner stabbed her and a social worker who was present uh, supervising this meeting. And Jasmine died, uh, she was, so she was murdered. Mm. So I guess here, like, it's a good example of, of uh, seeing some sort of sexual deviance as a threat to children, and how that sort of becomes uh, the ultimate good mother versus bad mother complex in our society. Mm. And also, sex work is the antithesis of good motherhood, that these two cannot be combined. Which is like very sort of, like, and that's, I think that's very deep, so it runs very deep in our society, in our like, beliefs of what motherhood should consist of. Like, these are very sort of charged, symbolically charged uh, arenas of what it is, in many ways. And it, of course, involves like class and gender, 
Uh, also nationality in many ways. In Finland, for example, uh, if the police or the border control suspects that the person is coming to sell sex, they can be denied access to the country. So they can be stopped at the border and sent back. So this is also like a very nationalist and sort of racialized form of border control where like sex and gender is heavily involved because it's mostly uh, queer people and women who come to sell sex. And, uh, so this is something that this is something that happens regularly, actually. Yeah. And there's another. Another. The next topic is not so fun either. I don't know. We're going like <laughs> deeper and deeper into this dark stuff. I'm sorry about that. Um, more sterilization. Is that a difficult? Should I explain the word? Sterilization. Uh, so basically. Uh, making a person unable to uh, give birth or, or conceive uh, um, children. You can do it hormonic, uh, like in a hormonal way or surgical way, like different methods uh, are applied. And, fo and forced or coerced is uh, when people can do it with their free will. This is... Uh, <coughs> I don't know, this, is, this picture always makes me really emotional when I look at it. I, it's, um, it's the tree of eugenics, or that's what they call it. Uh, it doesn't, uh, the name doesn't quite show there, but it's from the second international uh, uh, conference of eugenics from uh, 1921. And it says eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. So someone should be saying it's self directing this evolution. And it says, like a tree, eugenic draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into a harmonious inter entity. And there's biology and genetics and anthropology and statistics and genealogy and biolo biography and all these uh, fields of science, basically. And it makes me really angry, actually. Like, not just emotional, but it makes me angry and frustrated to look at this picture. Um, I guess that's why I put it up for you. Um, but um, with sterilization, I guess, uh, or in history, like there's a long history of sort of promoting high birth rates and uh, different governments being very eager to uh, have uh, families and mothers giving birth to as many babies as possible. Like this is part of as much like Finnish history, German history, Estonian history, Soviet history. Like it's very, it's sort of present in many different, um, in like in very different societies. Uh, not just the totalitarian ones, not just the fascist ones, but but really also actually in the in in countries that are considered welfare states and democratic in that sense. Mm. So there's been this aim to increase the birth rate. It's called pronatalism. Uh, comes from Latin. Uh, of course, also like decreasing child mortality is kind of important because it has been. Uh, I mean, it would be really sort of. It's really awkward statistically for like a country nowadays. You're going to have all these human rights initiatives, you know, at the back if you're if, if if the country has a really high birth rate and then child mortality rate is is also skyrocketing. So, um, so measures like uh, measures like nursing and medical services and, and different kind of tokens of uh, tokens of good motherhood, but also also uh, benefits, economic benefits, uh, have been used to sort of um, to get people make as much babies as possible. And then uh, and then this is something that like the fascist states really they sort of um, specialized in this, they, they really specialized in, in these motherhood trophies. And I mean, if you have seen all Soviet propaganda of, of like uh, women with their children, like that's kind of, you can think of what kind of imagery was used. And it's not actually so different from, um, then again, like, like for example, Nazi Germany, where this was like the whole motherhood tokens uh, business was a huge thing at the time. But it's not the only time. Mm. 
So yeah, they were exercising, basically they were exercising this firepower through discipline and death, but also promoting uh, things that they saw as, as uh, important and valuable. And Um, then there's the, well, we shall not look at Nazis or Germany actually, because that's uh, in terms of eugenics and in terms of this like more disciplined and violent forms of uh, biopolitics, it's very known. And I don't want to really talk about that, because it's been written in history many times, and as tragic as it is, there's uh, many other cases that should also, I think, be talked about much more. So uh, we're going to look at Sweden and Finland. And then I did some uh, research on Estonia as well, so it wouldn't be so detached. So uh, I did look into Estonian history as well shortly, and other examples. But there's a, the, a video that we're going to see. I hope it shows well. We're going to see how, how well it works. <coughs> Swedish uh, director Klaus Hara, uh, or something like this in Estonia. Okay. Um, it's uh, set in uh, 1950s Sweden, and it tells about Gertrude, uh, this girl, uh, who is the oldest daughter of this poor and really large working class uh, family. Mm. And after her mother's death, she and her sisters and brothers are all taken to custody and she's put into this women's institution. Uh, something in between like a youth home and a mental hospital and a work camp. And so it's not, the, not technically a nice place to be. Uh, and that's where the movie is setting, basically. Mm, but more about to get it from later. Also. <coughs> I think it's better to have time for discussion in the end than like, <coughs> like battle with the uh, technology. Mm -hmm. I'm like anti civilization. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all the back of the eugenic history. Well, that's actually kind of yeah, relates to the topic. So basically, uh, about Kertur, she's in the uh, painting in this youth home. Uh, in order to get out of this work home, you have to agree to be sterilized. So for obviously that's not really an agreement. And, um, and it's, so it's through sterilization that you can get out of this work home. And the work home, the aim of it is basically to sort of grow these uh, women to hardworking and sort of disciplined and, and, and not too sexually active uh, citizens of, of the Swedish nation state, I suppose you could say. Mm. And Gertrude, she's not diagnosed uh, with, she's not diagnosed crazy or uh, antisocial, as it would have been said at the time often. Um, she's not uh, feeble minded, which was another word used at the time for uh, mental disabilities. She did not have, she does not have epilepsy which was also a reason to be in this institution. Um, she's not uh, deaf and blind. And yeah, like there's actually friends of her. There's an epileptic friend and there's friends with uh, mental disabilities. Uh, the reason is that she's from a large family and she's, her parents are very poor. And because they conceived a lot, because they had a lot of children, uh, the social, authorities, they assume that when she grows up, she's also going to be sexually reckless and have a lot of children and not have money to uh, provide for these children. So it's better for her to be sterilized 
and, and not sort of uh, give birth to children who are going to be a burden to this uh, to the future welfare society, basically. And the reason I wanted to show this clip is because it's based on a true, true story. The, the script writer is uh, is actually uh, is a uh, daughter of this. Uh, of, uh, of one of the siblings who this happened to. So I think it was her auntie and, and the other siblings who actually faced this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, I guess you could say, tragedy. So, so it, was a, it was a really big thing in Sweden, back in the days. Um, so if we look at, okay, now we have to operate it for me. Oh. Hey, I see the. Now we have the mouse again. <laughs> we don't have the video. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Sweden. Uh, Finland is in brackets because not because it was. Uh, less severe or, or anything. It was less systematic, definitely. But the reason it's in bracket is because there's less research done on the Swedish eugenic poli eugenics politics. There's more research done on the Swedish project, which was very systematic. It went on for some 40 years. Um, there was a sterilization law uh, in the mid-1930s, and uh, the, the law was there, and, it, and this whole uh, project went on until the mid-70s. And the reasons we have to be forcefully or coerced, like coerced into sterilization, uh, some of them were medical, whatever that might mean, uh, eugenic, so in order to sort of maintain a, a, some sort of uh, ideal genetic pool of a society, of the ideal uh, welfare society, and social. So if you were considered to be a burden or not be able to, uh, take care of the children for some reason. Uh, and this is where the antisocial comes in. Uh, then uh, you could also be coerced or forced to be sterilized. Uh, about 20,000 to 30,000 30, forced or coerced sterilizations happened this week between these years, most of them during the first decades, but still. Um, that's a really big number. I mean, that's a huge number. Uh, I mean, that means something like 10 people, minimum, every week for 40 years on average. I think it's a lot. So, uh, in Finland it's uh, about 10,000 because there was about 7,500 who were sterilized on uh, this uh, sort of eugenic basis. And then there was some also some racialized, racially based reasons, but the, the statistics aren't so clear, so this is more like a guess of mine based on what I've read. Mm, and there were similar laws in other Nordic countries too, so it wasn't just in uh, Sweden, but because this is... Uh, Question. Were these institutions only for women, or did this happen to men as well? I'm glad you asked. Uh, rough guess, and this is my rough guess, I would say about 95% of these people who were sterilized were women, uh, maybe more. So it's a very gendered institution as well. Um, I mean, there is uh, there's a long history of forced vasectomy as well in places like uh, Peru, for example. Uh, I don't know so much about India. I know it's been going on, but uh, a married majority of these people worldwide who this has happened to are, are uh, uh, assigned women yes. or female assigned. So, yeah, interesting. Um, and with the and, and, and with the with the criteria, I mean, it can be it can really be anything. Uh, this antisocial behavior was often connected to uh, uh, whatever was immoral as well. So you could say that a lot of these like sexual deviants at the time, for example, would face this uh, would face this sort of destiny. Uh, because they were not considered sort of fit in terms of what is a good citizenship. So again, we go back to the good citizenship and the good parent and the and the, the 
good male male sort of uh, stereotypes. Mm. Uh, so sexual de deviance was definitely one criteria. Uh, disability, huge one. Like this is something that has affected disab disabled communities worldwide so much, and it's really like not a lot. Of, there's not a lot of discussion about it, um, and it's huge. So, yeah. Uh, and for example, in Finland, until 1969, I, yeah, 1969. Uh, uh, if you had innate epilepsy, so epilepsy that you have had, you've been diagnosed with at birth, um, you were uh, you were legally not allowed to marry because marriage is the institution where all the family business happens. So they wanted to protect that institution from people with epilepsy. But yeah, it doesn't make sense, probably. <coughs> but uh, but it's true. Uh, and another one. Uh, also, until 1969, uh, two people who were blind and deaf could not marry each other. It was in, it was legally it was not possible to get married. So this kind of institutions have existed until like very late, so long ago even. And then I looked into Estonia a little bit because I didn't want it to be completely unattached from uh, Estonia. There's a uh, this uh, interesting book called Blood and Homeland that turn, deals with Eastern European, uh, I don't know if you think of Estonia as Eastern Europe, but, uh, but uh, <coughs> Eastern European countries and their uh, eugenic and racial politics. Uh, mostly in the, in the early 1900s until like 1940. Um, but yeah, Estonia had, a, had a, this uh, board of population increase and welfare. So also this like pro-natalist approach was like a really big thing here. And I think Estonia being a country with a really small population, this was especially a huge concern for the politicians. Like a worry that maybe someone who is bigger is gonna come and take over. So we need to be many, we need to have lots of babies in order to sort of survive and not be wiped out by another uh, genetically different uh, people who was just gonna come and rampage. And uh, if you look at like today's discussions about uh, like this Islam Islamophobic discussion about how Europe is going to be invaded by uh, by Islam, like it has a similar sort of like you can see the roots of fear are very similar in terms of like who is having more children and all that. Like so, it's not like this is not a, this is a contemporary subject in many ways, but uh, but it was uh, in, but it was very much. Uh, present and sort of, it was all over the place in the 1930s in Europe, uh, fascist times. And there was a sterilization law. I don't exactly know how many sterilizations happened because of it, but I know that a lot of the research shows or, or like a lot of researchers say that the law was there because they wanted to legitimize a practice that already existed. So it's not like it started in the 30s, but they wanted to legitimize it in order to make it legal and more sort of systematic. Uh, it didn't go on, it didn't go on as long as in Finland or Sweden. It was not as huge of an institution. But again, we are talking about a smaller population as well. Yeah. But there was this uh, national entirety, something like Rahus I don't know if I'm saying it right. Uh, that was uh, thrown around at the time. So. Uh, was the goal. Other, other countries where this happened, this is just uh, examples. I mean, just there, this is not uh, exclusive at all. Germany, Denmark, United States, uh, United States of uh, America also like immensely, and, and I would imagine in Canada as well, like uh, this is something that targeted the indigenous populations, as well as in Puerto Rico and Peru. Mm, Czechoslovakia and Czech Republic. Etc. Many of these, uh, many of these, went on for quite a while actually. Um, I, I could tell a little bit about uh, Puerto Rico and Peru and Czech Republic. I think because those are sort of not so well known. So I will say a few words about it. Um, in Puerto Rico, there was like a huge concern over uh, overpopulation. Uh, it's a small place. If you know any, anything about the history, it was really like the politics and the history of Puerto Rico in the 1900s is very much dominated by uh, by uh, United States sort of imperialist uh, 
agenda. So a lot of the economic intervention, a lot of political intervention, and then it comes medical intervention. So, um, so it's really interesting because it has this colonial aspect to it. Um, I guess uh, Puerto Rican uh, people uh, or women being poor and often not being very highly educated, they were considered uh, unfit or not capable of uh, managing other means of contraception. So these uh, birth control clinics, like dozens of them were established within like a decade. There were like hundreds of new clinics just came up. And most of the funding came from the US, from uh, researchers and, and medics in the US. So really from the outside. And, uh, and like the number of, like if you look at statistics, the number of Puerto Rican women who have been sterilized uh, like for, if you look at certain age groups, like it's it's uh, it's unbelievable. It's like every every fourth person or something. Like it's really like it's unbelievable. If you look at the numbers, so it was not a small project at all. Um, and uh, also, I mean, these programs being planned and uh, planned and funded from the United States, like with the contraception pill, which sort of appeared around the same time. It has also an interesting history because uh, that was also strongly advocated, and the research was really was like strongly sponsored by white middle class uh, academics and researchers in the U.S. and a lot of also a lot of uh, like middle class white feminists who wanted to uh, like who really wanted and needed this invention, and. Uh, it became available to Western women very quickly, but the, per, the pill was first tested uh, in these poor urban slum districts of Latin America. So that's where sort of the testing happened. So we are talking about this human experience on like, on like poor and brown Latina women, basically, uh, who are living on colonized land and then we're talking about like a freedom of choice in terms of how like white women saw it at a time. And I mean it was like it did give a lot of freedom. It was really like a revolutionary thing. People call it revolutionary. But this is like it's a good example of how the power axis and the power dynamics they can be removed. They're still there. And you can't make them disappear. I mean there's a lot of good inventions, like nice inventions if you look at for example like children's health care was like a like it was a huge project to establish like a, a like a nationwide uh, children's uh, children's healthcare in Nazi Germany because it was it was their agenda but it doesn't mean that healthcare is a bad thing you know it just means that these sort of axes of power are there and, and they cannot be taken away just like that like you have to fight to get rid of them mm. but yeah that's about Puerto Rico. Uh, also, uh, Peru, interesting because it happened mostly in the 1990s, so, so this is not like a 1930s project, but much later. Uh, and there's like hundreds of thousands of sterilizations that happened there. Um, but here it's, uh, it's actually some, yeah, 25,000 vasectomies as well. So it was not just, uh, so it was not as gendered as, as in many other places, although you can see the difference in the numbers, like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, so you get the picture. But uh, in Peru also, there's like, there was campaigns and there was this mass sterilization events that went on, and of course a lot of it was also uh, voluntary, but that also raises the question of like, how, how are people sort of seen fit and able of controlling their own bodies and often it comes down to class and ethnicity in many ways because people who are uh, people who are poor people who don't have education they are less often considered uh, fit and capable so the sterilization was a better option for them according to the authorities than for example giving them the pill that was invented 40 years before so here you see that you, you get the idea yes mm. And in, in, in Peru, it happened a lot. Uh, it happened uh, mostly in urban areas, mostly in areas that were really um, like where the population was really dominated by indigenous communities. And a lot of these communities actually had like long, 
militant conflicts with the state. So that also brings another level of oppression into the picture. Uh, that these people were not, basically these people were not, uh, it, it was not seen as a good thing that these people reproduce to uh, have more children. And uh, then Czechoslovakia, I mean, uh, this is like a, that's really like an example of ethnic uh, cleansing in many ways. Um, because it's exclusively something that happened to Roma people, Roma women, actually. Um, there's uh, from like early 70s until about year 2001 at least, uh, there's proof. Uh, that these people have been coerced into sterilization in, sterilization in exchange for uh, uh, social benefits. And if you have looked into the situation of Roma people today and how precarious they are, and sort of people who don't get papers or birth certificates for their children, you can imagine that this exchange is, was not very sort of, it's not a free trade, you know. So, uh, and this went on for a long time. I don't know how much it has been confronted. I know that the international Roma rights communities have sort of tried to uh, make a big number out of it, but I'm not sure how much they have sort of done in terms of visibility. Mm. And then there's uh, oh yeah, and then there's transgender people, uh, which is not in the slides, but uh, but the sterilization uh, is. Uh, is still, for example, in Finland, it's a criteria uh, for a trans person to change their juridical uh, gender. So uh, there's that. Uh, 2017. Uh, yeah, and all that. Still, uh, still working on that issue. So again, this is like really contemporary stuff. Mm. Oh, no. Lessons to learn. Uh, I wanted to write down something in the end because it's like a whole mess of really uncomfortable and really sort of nasty stuff and I don't really, I, mean, I don't know how to conclude this thing, like it's, it's not nice to talk about this, but um, I guess what I, what I want to say is that history is not some progress, like evident progression for the better, like nobody knows if it's going to get better, it's up to the people in the present to decide that and act upon it. Um, and it's like fascism inspired control politics as part of politics, like they are a contemporary question, they are, they are not something in the past and they're not something that happened in Germany and didn't exist elsewhere. That's also like a really dangerous and false narrative when we look at eugenics, is that we think of something that, it, like looking at it as a German thing is very dangerous because then we exclude all these other histories of uh, oppression basically. And I guess also about mechanisms of power that I talked about. I mean, they change over time. No one's being executed in the in the main square of Old Town on Sundays, you know, for doing something bad. But there's other means of control, and there's other means of sort of social control and management that sort of that actually make us who we are uh, in many ways. And I think we should keep our eyes open to that. That's what I want to say. And because today's power power can often be quite subtle uh, and indirect. And it's very much medicalized and it's very much internalized. It's very much internalized in our own sort of identities and in our own fears and anxieties. Uh, so they're kind of harder to recognize sort of these direct forms of discipline. Mm. Then I wanted to conclude uh, because of what has been going on during the past few years in Europe or decades, depending on your perspective. Uh, it got me thinking about uh, necropolitics as an opposition of biopolitics, so not managing life, but managing death. Uh, the politics of who, is, uh, who has to die and whose life is worth protecting. And, uh, and that got me thinking about the EU and the fortress Europe and about Finnish migration politics. Um, and European migration politics, of course. Uh, I don't know, I see that as like the 21st century necropolitics in a way, so like the politics of death. That uh, we have the border industrial system, which is well funded, and there's like a whole structure uh, 
outside the EU borders, but also it sort of extends within the European borders and it extends outside to Morocco and a lot of other places. Um, so we have this border industrial system. And then we have skyrocketing arms trade. Uh, Finland is, uh, for example, doing arms export with Saudi Arabia. Patria is a 60% state owned company. So the state benefits from this arms trade. So these conflicts that are sort of happening very far away, they're very connected to European politics at the same time. So this politics of death is, is not. It's not a Middle Eastern thing, it's not a Syrian thing when we look at today's situation in Syria, for example, but it's a global thing. Um, and then if we look at sort of post-colonial era, or I don't know if it's so post, I think colonial era has not really stopped. Uh, but if we look at the exploitation of the global south in general, and like sort of the, the today's <coughs> and how that sort of puts people in very precarious positions, like uh, in terms of access to health uh, services, food, water, clean water, all that. Um, there's definitely a hierarchy, and that hierarchy is being maintained by the by the two above, by the arms trade and by the border. <coughs> so I don't know. I guess I want to ask whose life is worth protecting, and sort of could we call that the indirect eugenics of today? That, we that the borders are being closed from people who are like literally drowning in the sea uh, and dying outside of these borders. So also in terms of like who gets to, like whose bodies get to matter, like are brown bodies really that sort of uh, unimportant? And black bodies too. And I mean, we have movements like Black Lives Matter and all those uh, different like wonderful movements who are trying to sort of raise this question and put more, uh, uh, like put that in the front, sort of, and bring visibility to that. But uh, is that enough in terms of like how much is going on? I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess we should, but yeah, we should, we should organize. That's, I think, a good reason to organize. So uh, yeah. Um, do we have find the video? Well, it's a trailer. You can find it online. Uh, it's a good movie. I recommend it. But I mean, the trailer is only like a few minutes. So the movie is a couple of hours. You can watch it at home if you find it. Maybe you can uh, post the link to the trailer in the uh, under the event. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you can see it. Uh, if you have time, because I would if there's any questions or uh, uh, any like comments that you want to sort of, anything you want to say, uh, there's time, but you can.